America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our guest is Mr. Shinzo Abe, former Prime Minister of Japan. Mr. Abe has been a member of the Japanese Diet, Japan's national legislature, since 1993. Mr. Abe was Japan's longest sitting Prime Minister, serving from 2006 to 2007 and 2012 to 2020. Prime Minister Abe left a lasting legacy in the history of Japan. Upon his return to prime ministership, he advanced an optimistic vision to help bring Japan out of economic and political darkness following the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake. His trademark economic policies dubbed Abenomics, and his proactive diplomacy expanded Japan's global influence. Prime Minister Abe's foreign and defense policies aimed to make a proactive contribution to peace. He established the National Security Secretariat, equivalent of the U.S. National Security Council in 2013, released the first-ever national security strategy in that same year, and enacted the legislation for peace and security in 2016. He steered the reinterpretation of Japan's constitution to expand the situations under which Japan can exercise collective self-defense. Under the Obama administration, Prime Minister Abe hosted President Barack Obama's visit to Hiroshima and conducted his own visit to Pearl Harbor. He was the first Japanese leader to address a joint meeting of U.S. Congress, where he described the unwavering Japan-U.S. alliance as an alliance of hope. Prime Minister Abe maintained a close rapport with three U.S. presidents, but his Gulf diplomacy with President Donald Trump from Mar-a-Lago to Bedminster, to Tokyo, received the most attention from the international press. Prime Minister Abe was the first world leader to elaborate the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. He promoted cooperation among the Quad of Japan, the United States, Australia, and India to address emerging challenges in the region. Prime Minister Abe promoted international agreements to improve security and prosperity, his government was a key player in the 2016 signing of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the establishment of the Data Free Flow with Trust initiative in 2019. Prime Minister Abe fostered cooperation among world leaders, including at the 2016 G7 Isashima Summit and as chair of the 2019 G20 Osaka Summit. Throughout his tenure, Prime Minister Abe confronted numerous foreign policy challenges, including North Korea's nuclear and missile programs, and North Korean abductions of Japanese citizens, territorial disputes and the pursuit of a peace treaty with Russia, tensions with the Republic of Korea, and an increasingly aggressive Chinese Communist Party. His leadership raised Japan's profile on the international stage. He oversaw Tokyo's successful bid to host the 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games at the 2013 IOC session in Buenos Aires, and appeared in the closing ceremony of the Rio Olympic Games in 2016, where he popped out of a pipe dressed as Super Mario. We welcome Prime Minister Abe to reflect on his legacy as Prime Minister, hear his perspective on shared security challenges, and contemplate the future for free and open societies in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Prime Minister Abe, welcome to Battlegrounds. It is an honor to host you. Working with you and your talented team was a highlight of my time as National Security Advisor, and it's wonderful to see you again. Well, General McMaster, it's been quite long since we last saw each other, and it is a tremendous honor and pleasure for me to have a, this uh, conversation uh, with you uh, today. Uh, today, uh, I certainly look forward to having a discussion with you uh, featuring the uh, security environment at this moment, as well as the ways to strengthen Japan-US alliance. 
Thank you, Prime Minister. And, and thank you especially for your leadership and your vision at a critical time. I thought we might as well begin with what was our one of our top priorities anyway in, in, in our in our work uh, to uh, to promote uh, security and, and prosperity for both our countries and, and across the world. Uh, I remember finally my first meeting with your national security advisor, Yachi Shitaro, and, and the issue, of course, at the top of our agenda then, which was how to address the challenge from China and the Chinese Communist Party, seems today to be the priority really across the whole free world. So I thought I might just begin by asking you about the security threat from China, uh, an expanding military that is continuing provocations against Taiwan, Japan's Senkaku Islands, the South China Sea, India's Himalayan frontier, and really across the whole Indo-Pacific. So I know our, our audience would love to hear your view of the, the military threats from China. And then how does Japan plan uh, to address those threats? Well, speaking of the location of Japan, uh, Japan is located just next to China uh, with the uh, thin strip of water uh, next to each other. So among all the G7 uh, nations, uh, we are at the forefront uh, when it comes to uh, the impact and influence of China, particularly in the context of the security and military affairs. Well, speaking of the uh, history of Japan, especially in the context of security affairs, uh, when we had the former USSR, uh, the fighters uh, coming to USSR uh, were the ones uh, who intruded into the Japanese uh, ADIC. Of course, at this moment, we still see Russian fighters uh, intruding into the ADIC, but mainly uh, we are dealing uh, with uh, the flights of the Chinese uh, fighters uh, entering the Japanese ADIC. And again, such backdrop, the Japanese self-defense forces are now addressing this situation by having a series of scrambles. In the last 30 years, China has uh, been rising militarily and also very significantly. Their military spending got increased by 42 times in the last 30 years. And as of now, their spending uh, is uh, almost four times as large as Japanese defense spending. So when you look at these numbers, uh, you can have the first-hand understanding about the Chinese intention and will. And uh, with uh, these uh, ill will and determination, uh, China has been continuing its unilateral attempts to change the status quo uh, in South China Sea, in East China Sea, and elsewhere in the world. Hey. And then uh, I uh, return to uh, the post and role of the prime minister in Japan at the end of uh, 2012. And uh, starting uh, in the year 2013, I decided uh, to materialize our unwavering determination uh, to enhance Japan's own defense capability. Before I came back as prime minister, uh, Japan has had been cutting its defense spending uh, for 10 consecutive years. But uh, since I came back, uh, we successfully uh, increased the national defense spending every year. And also as part of uh, my administration's initiative, uh, Japan uh, decided to uh, deploy a total of 147 F-35 jets, and this process has already begun. And also my administration uh, decided uh, to deploy standoff missiles as part of Japan's defense uh, effort. And starting 2021, uh, fiscal year, uh, we also started to develop our own long-range standoff uh, missile uh, that could be fired uh, from uh, the ground. So uh, along that line, we have been making every effort to enhance Japan's own defense capability. When we look back the history, uh, we saw many instances and cases uh, where one side had misunderstanding and underestimate the will and capability of the other side, and that eventually led confrontation or disputes. So in that context, I do believe that it remains very important uh, for us to make China realize Japan's determination and also have correct understanding about Japan's uh, capability. And that will remain the key. 
When I was a prime minister in my direct conversation with President Xi of China, I specifically told him never to underestimate Japan's unwavering determination as to our right over the Senkaku Islands. And also as to the Taiwan Straits, at the most recent Japan-U.S. summit meeting, both leaders specifically underscored the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait in their joint statement. And also at the outcome of the G7 summit in Cornwall, the G7 leaders also specifically underscored this point. And I do believe that these developments are extremely important. By doing this effort, we successfully demonstrated Japan's unwavering will, but also the unwavering determination of the alliance between Japan and the United States, together with the firm will of the G7 leaders as a whole. So we successfully sent out a very robust message to China. And some might say that uh, the actions that we have been taking are challenging China, but that is not the case. By doing this, we are sending a robust message to China uh, and also demonstrating our will and our capability uh, of uh, the alliance uh, as well as the individual uh, nation state. And also moving forward, I do think that uh, sending out such a message to China uh, will encourage China uh, to realize that it will be unproductive and it will not serve their interest uh, if China uh, sticks to its policy of constantly expanding militarily. And uh, I do think that through our message, uh, we're now showing China uh, which way that they should uh, take and also which direction that they should aim for uh, in the role of security. By doing that, uh, we'll be able uh, to avoid China's miscalculation or misunderstanding. And through that, uh, we'll be able uh, to avoid any confrontation with China. So these messaging uh, will be the key uh, for us as we move forward. Well, Prime Minister, I, I agree with you that really the key is to deter conflict with China, and that can only be done through strength. And I think, of course, the, and I know that you believe that the Japan-U.S. alliance is, is critical to demonstrating that strength. I often mention the speech that you gave in front of the joint session of Congress that, that was very eloquent in, in connection with the importance of the alliance and the, and the miracle of the alliance. And, and you made every effort to, to strengthen uh, the alliance militarily. Uh, you mentioned some of the measures. You also included uh, and, and worked on the, the reinterpretation of the Constitution, which would enable Japan to, which is enabling Japan to exercise the right to collective self-defense in, in certain situations in an environment of, of growing threats. And uh, I just wondered if you could share with our viewers what your top priorities are for strengthening Japan-U.S. cooperation, uh, including in, in the security area, maybe especially in the area of security. Against the backdrop of the military rise of China, uh, I elaborated my views uh, on the need for Japan uh, to establish a robust defense posture. In the year 2012, I uh, came back as a prime minister, and next year, in 2013, my administration decided to establish a national security secretariat and uh, also, uh, we, for the first time in the history of Japan, uh, released the Japanese uh, national security strategy. General just uh, mentioned uh, my uh, address to a joint session of uh, US Congress. And as you may recall, as part of my address, I highlighted the contribution uh, and uh, sacrifice made by the uh, U.S. Uh, forces, especially uh, under the Tomoda uh, Operation Tomodachi in the aftermath of the Great East Japan earthquake. Thanks to uh, this operation, uh, the United States has saved so many lives of Japanese people. And in that address, I told the audience that I still vividly recall every contribution uh, made by the U.S. side. 
And in view of potential contingency in the region, uh, my determination uh, was to transform our alliance into something uh, under which both Japan and the United States can help each other. And I do believe that by ensuring uh, that the two sides can help with each other, we'll have more robust bond uh, under the alliance. And uh, under uh, such thinking, uh, in the year 2014, I and my administration uh, decided to change the interpretation of the Constitution. Prior to that, uh, we had the interpretation uh, that will not allow the exercise of uh, collective uh, self-defense right, uh, but I changed the interpretation and based on that, uh, my administration developed and enacted legislation for peace and security. And uh, thanks to the enactment of the legislation for peace and security, Japanese self-defense forces are now uh, uh, doing their operation uh, for the asset protection uh, of the uh, U.S. military assets uh, in the surrounding environment of, of Japan. Both the Japanese airplanes, uh, fighter jets, and vessels are now protecting uh, American uh, military assets. And also in terms of the number of Japan-U.S. Uh, joint training and exercises, 20 years ago, we only had uh, 20 times per year. But in the year 2020, uh, the, now, the total number has become 49. Uh, so uh, the entire number has uh, got more than doubled. And that is a testament uh, to what the legislation for peace and security brought uh, for our alliance. And I do think that our alliance uh, has become much closer in practical sense uh, under uh, this new legislation. An indeed summit meeting between Prime Minister Suga and President Biden. Uh, President uh, specifically highlighted uh, American commitment uh, to the defense of Japan, including the application of Article 5 of Japan-U.S. Security Treaty to the Senkaku Islands. And I highly value uh, such uh, outcome of the summit meeting. And on top of that, the two leaders uh, decided to accelerate uh, bilateral consultation and deliberation to enhance the alliance's uh, deterrence as well as response capabilities in the new domains, including outer space, cyberspace, as well as electromagnetic uh, waves. And I think the key for both sides will uh, how we can uh, achieve concrete outcome uh, through uh, such a steady consultation uh, across all domains. And also our alliance and our bilateral cooperation has is not all about uh, security uh, affairs. Uh, on top of our security cooperation, uh, we are taking a number of initiatives in various areas, including our cooperation in our effort to realize a free and open Indo-Pacific, our bilateral cooperation uh, in enhancing our competitive edge and also promoting uh, innovation in the role of digital affairs as well as science and technology. We do also continue our collaboration uh, in the imminent uh, challenges that we are facing, uh, such as the corona uh, response and global health. And also climate change uh, is another big issue that we have been working. The implementation of the Paris uh, Accord as well as the development uh, and uh, uh, application of clean technology, as well as decarbonization. Uh, so the green growth uh, will be another area that we have been working. And the entire world is actually counting on us, Japan and the United States, to bring tangible uh, outcome uh, through these initiatives. And if we are to successfully materialize our cooperation in these uh, the various areas, I do think that we'll be able to further deepen our alliance. Prime Minister, I think the, you know, this is a really important point is that the competition with China involves obviously an economic dimension as well. But part of that is for us to maintain our competitive advantages, working together to, to develop and apply emerging and important technologies 
uh, efforts to make supply chains more resilient. Uh, COVID-19 highlighted the urgent importance of that. I know that you've recently taken on some additional responsibilities uh, in, in, in Parliament on, on supply chain resiliency, especially in connection with semiconductors, and, and then also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, aspects of energy security and how that relates to climate change. So could you share with our viewers what more we have to do, the United States, Japan, uh, to, to maintain our competitive advantages? In technology and from an economic perspective. For this year, uh, due to the insufficient uh, supply of the uh, semiconductors uh, worldwide, we have experienced the uh, hold of the production of autos. Uh, and uh, that actually uh, made us recognize uh, that semiconductors are the indispensable foundation for any industry that uh, we have at this moment. And we all recognize the importance of uh, how uh, we can make our supply chains uh, more uh, resilient. Emerging technologies, including semiconductors, batteries, and the rare earth, uh, have direct implication uh, of the nation's uh, national security. And that's why Japan also decided uh, to promote uh, our uh, uh, interest uh, in this area uh, under a nation's uh, strategy. And speaking of my own party, uh, LDP, uh, also uh, decided uh, to make every effort uh, on this front. And I myself uh, have been serving as a flag bearer uh, to promote our economic uh, security uh, interest. Speaking of China's uh, response, they have been trying everything uh, that they can uh, enhance their industries uh, under its own state capitalism. But uh, we, as a like-minded nations, also uh, do everything we can to protect and promote our own industries. And when you think about the involvement uh, and encouragement uh, from the national government, uh, you tend to uh, focus on the aspect of protection uh, of the uh, state-of-the-art uh, technologies, uh, such as the export uh, control. But having said that, another aspect that we have to pay attention is the promotion. We have to do everything we can uh, to assist research and development, as well as support our supply uh, chains. And uh, in the role of economic security, of course, protection is important. But uh, what I like to underscore here is that we have to uh, make these two requirements of protection, and a promotion uh, to uh, be realized in this area. The most important uh, mission that we have to achieve is to ensure that countries sharing fundamental values, such as freedom, democracy, basic human rights, the rule of law, and fairness, continue uh, its uh, cooperation and move forward in a concerted manner. As I said earlier, at the most recent Japan-U.S. summit meeting, both sides decided to uh, continue deliberation uh, on the uh, bilateral cooperation in economic uh, security role. Uh, but uh, we also need to do everything uh, we can to bring together the wisdom and strength of the like-minded nations in a global scale and I think this could be uh, characterized as an effort to set up a tech alliance among the like-minded nations. And I think this will be uh, another initiative that we have to seek. I, I agree. I think this is a great idea. What some people are calling a, a D10 or a T10 of, of, of democratic countries. You know, uh, Prime Minister, you, you were, you were a, a big promoter of, of the vision of a free and open in Pacific. And and this this was aimed at at strengthening us uh, in you know economically and from a security perspective, but really from a perspective of of principles and, and values as well. And you know I think that the promotion of of democratic governance and basic human rights and and uh, and rule of law and and freedom of speech 
uh, these aren't just an exercise in, in altruism, that promotion. It's also one of the best means to, to counter uh, the Chinese Communist Party vision, which is quite different uh, and, and aimed at, I think, creating servile relationships with countries through programs like the Belt and Road Initiative and the, and the, uh, and the debt trap that they set for countries. As you look now at this very strong legacy that you've left with the free and open Indo-Pacific, what, what else do you think we have to do to realize your vision? We talked about technology and, and, and security and economic competition, but how would you mind commenting a little bit on what more we can do to promote the, the free and open vision as an alternative to, to China's authoritarian mercantilist model? Well, surrounding Japan, uh, there's vast oceans, the Indian Ocean as well as the Pacific Ocean. And in order for us to uh, transform these two vast oceans uh, into an international public good, uh, which would serve for prosperity, not only the region, but also the entire world, it will be critically important uh, to maintain free and open order uh, based on the rule of law. And in order for us to realize such order uh, that is free and open, uh, there has to be something that would underpin such uh, order. And that is the compliance uh, of the international law by all nation states. And my vision uh, was to uh, ensure all like my nations uh, come together uh, by sharing fundamental values and also uh, sharing determination to maintain and protect uh, such free and open order. That was the thinking that I had uh, when I elaborated my vision of a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. Back in August 2007, I had an honor uh, to give an address to the Indian parliament where I had delivered my speech titled Confluence of the Two Seas. And I elaborated uh, my vision uh, on that occasion uh, and highlighting uh, the new concept of this geopolitical uh, uh, idea of Indo-Pacific uh, as uh, one word. And uh, the VoIP concept is something uh, that I, I came to elaborate and further develop uh, based on the thinking that I laid out uh, in uh, India. Under the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, I set three main pillars. First uh, was to the promotion of the fundamental values, including the freedom of navigation, as well as the rule of law. Second uh, was the uh, economic uh, prosperity uh, through the infrastructure, infrastructure development, as well as ensuring connectivity uh, in the region. And the final pillar uh, was the collaboration uh, to realize peace and stability uh, through capacity building effort uh, for the maritime law enforcement and other aspects. And my vision uh, was the one uh, which drove Japan to work other like-minded nations to seek concrete collaboration along with these three main pillars. And President Biden now also endorses uh, this uh, thinking of FOIP and our collaboration. And as of now, Japan and the United States are working together as valued partners. And I am very happy to see such close collaboration between the two sides. Our vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific is an open one and also an inclusive effort under which uh, we would uh, welcome any nations uh, that uh, share uh, the fundamental thinking and uh, our shared uh, vision. So moving forward, the key uh, will be uh, how we can effectively bring uh, more nations and partners on board uh, in this process of realizing a free and open Indo-Pacific, and also how we can continue uh, every effort to materialize specific and concrete uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation. You know, I, I think this is a really important point for our viewers. These aren't just words. I mean, I've, I've seen the actions, right, and, and th that have occurred in the format of the free and open Indo-Pacific. Freedom of navigation 
exercises through the South China Sea that, that are now done routinely at a multinational level. Uh, the, the leadership that, that uh, Japan has taken in establishing uh, standards for infrastructure investment across the region. The actions that Japan has led in the World Trade Organization is another e example, I think. So I just want to make sure our viewers know that there's been a, a tremendous amount of progress. And in one of the areas that w was an early part of your vision, I think right after you gave that speech, I think in India in 2007, you were an advocate of the quad format, the quad uh, sort of the anchoring uh, the, the free and open Indo-Pacific from India to Australia, to Japan, to the United States. And you know the first ever quad summit meeting was held earlier this year. I hope that you were proud of that because I think you you really are the one who who started uh, the momentum uh, behind that. And I'd just like to ask for your assessment of the quad and and what your vision is for the quad going forward. Well, even when I first served as a prime minister, I uh, focused on this need for us to materialize quad cooperation. And behind this uh, was uh, my uh, thinking about uh, India. India uh, was back then also uh, a large nation population-wise uh, compared to China, and also it is a huge democracy uh, in Asia. And also I could see great potential uh, for growth uh, of this country. So that is why I have been focusing on India. So back then, uh, I laid out my vision about Quad uh, to President Bush of the United States, Prime Minister Howard of Australia, as well as Prime Minister Mamohan Sin uh, of India. And they all shared my view. But back then, the rise of China, especially in the military and security realm, uh, was not as conspicuous as we uh, see at this moment. And uh, three uh, nations uh, did not share uh, the imminent and urgent need uh, for us to materialize such cooperation under the Quad uh, framework. So back then, we only had director general level consultation uh, under the Quad concept and we did not have any ministerial or summit level collaboration. And then uh, when I came back as prime minister again, I uh, started to work on uh, the realization of Quad uh, among the four uh, like-minded nations. And behind us uh, was a greater assertiveness uh, shown by China in its unilateral attempts to change the status quo. And the year 2016, on the occasion of the TCAD uh, meeting, uh, Tokyo International Conference on African Development, I uh, uh, explained uh, Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Unfortunately, President Trump uh, back then uh, bought my argument and he endorsed this vision. And same as Australia and India, uh, they uh, are very positive about this quad cooperation. So speaking of the United States, uh, from President Trump uh, to uh, President Biden, uh, they maintained this policy and emphasis on the FOIP. And also in Australia, uh, starting from Prime Minister Abbott uh, to Prime Minister Turnbull and Prime Minister Morrison, uh, they also uh, share the importance of this initiative uh, so as to ensure uh, regional stability. Same as in India, Prime Minister Modi has been quite effective uh, in following through his determination uh, to maintain this quad cooperation. And then in September 2019, there was the first ever foreign ministers quad meeting on the margins of the UN General Assembly followed by the first ever uh, summit, a quad summit meeting in March uh, this year. So I'm very happy uh, to see these steady uh, progress uh, in our quad uh, cooperation. As an outcome of the first ever quad summit meeting uh, back in March, the leaders uh, decided uh, to promote cooperation in new domains, uh, including 
supply of vaccines, ensuring and protecting critical and emerging technologies, as well as climate change. And they decided to set up uh, three separate working groups to promote cooperation uh, on top of the traditional cooperation that uh, we have been continuing uh, in areas such as quality uh, infrastructure, as well as maritime security. So moving forward, I do think that the key for four of us will be to materialize practical and concrete uh, cooperation uh, under the quad. You know, one of those areas of cooperation was another area that were, you, you were, I think pioneered years ago and that this was, was what is now being called the data free flow with trust or DFFT. And, and uh, this is one of these new arenas of competition, right? Whoever makes the rules on, on data is going to have a competitive advantage. And of course, China is trying to bend those rules in favor of its authoritarian model. Uh, so I wondered, would you, would you mind sharing your thoughts on, on that initiative in, in particular, but then also what more can be done uh, in, in the areas of, of trade agreements. I know that you were in this a conversation many times uh, with us, uh, with President Trump uh, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I, you know the difficulties in passing any multilateral trade agreement in the United States, regardless of which political party is in, in charge. But what is your vision for the future on initiatives like the digital, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the data-free flow with trust, uh, yeah. and, tra and trade agreements. Uh, what else do you think we have to do internationally uh, to to con to convince China that you know our system works and that China can benefit most by participating in that system rather than trying to subvert it. When we talk about the military rise of China, I uh, uh, underscore the importance of the compliance of international law and respect for rules in the area of maritime security. And this emphasis and focus on rules and international law can be applied to the economic role as well. And against that backdrop, I firmly believe that the TPP has played a very significant role. Under this framework, we successfully established free and fair rules uh, that uh, is be befitting uh, to the 21st century in a wide range of areas, including the protection of IPs, environment, labor, and also our effort to ensure a level playing field and regulate the uh, conditions vis-a-vis -vis the state-owned enterprises. Also under TTP, uh, we set up a comprehensive and high-level rules in the uh, rapidly uh, growing uh, e-commerce uh, realm as well. And this agreement specifically had articles to ensure free flow of data. And that is why the TPP was such an epoch-making endeavor. And on top of TPP, my administration uh, took the lead uh, in the global efforts to set up rules uh, that will be befitting uh, to the new era, including uh, my uh, vision of data free flow with trust, DFFT, uh, which you rightly mentioned, as well as the conclusion of the Japan US digital trade agreement. And I am proud of what we have done uh, in this area. Uh, of course, the world is changing rapidly uh, as we see the rapid progress of technologies. But I do think that it is Japan and the United States uh, that share the responsibility to take the lead in the rule making process under the new era uh, because we are the ones who share fundamental values, such as freedom, democracy, basic human rights, and the rule of law. And speaking of the presence of China, uh, they successfully uh, achieved a rapid uh, economic growth uh, since they entered uh, WTO. And China itself is fully aware of uh, this uh, development. And 
Uh, in the context of the uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, uh, I do think that there are demands uh, for uh, this uh, initiative. And as a matter of fact, there are a number of European countries uh, that uh, are uh, working uh, and collaborating with this uh, Chinese initiative. But uh, what is more important here uh, is uh, to look at the potential impact and influence uh, that the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, will eventually bring to the world. And uh, in light of the events of China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, Japan uh, decided to uh, shore its willingness to cooperate with China case by cases. And if there are projects that China uh, would respect the shared principles, then uh, we uh, will be ready and willing uh, to cooperate with China. And that's the stance that I uh, demonstrated. What I mean by the shared principles is the uh, four-pronged uh, quality infrastructure uh, principles. The first is openness. The second is transparency. The third is economic efficiency in view of life cycle cost, and fourth, economic soundness and debt sustainability. China uh, once uh, was opposing uh, this uh, four-pronged principles that Japan set forth, but eventually, uh, on the occasion of the G20 Osaka summit in the year 2019, where I served as a chair, China also joined us on board to endorse uh, this principle. And my firm belief is that if China is to respect and implement this four-pronged principle, then the whole international community will accept China uh, as a credible uh, partner. And that would eventually enable China's further uh, growth. Uh, the key is to uh, make sure that uh, we as the nations and alliance uh, will promote uh, such fundamental values in various areas and translate our shared values into concrete rules and proactively uh, lay out our ambition uh, in uh, that role. If we are to set out rules based on fundamental values, then uh, no country can ignore or disregard uh, such rules. Prime Minister, we, we I can't believe we're almost running out of time, but I do want to ask you about more of the world. And and so I'll ask, ask you some quick questions. None of them are easy, but I think you visited something like 80, 80 countries in your eight years as, as prime minister. So I want to broaden our perspective a little bit. But first, by asking you a question that's very close to Japan, which and, and a danger that's close to Japan, which is North Korea. You know, we work very hard to align our approach on on uh, on North Korea in 2017 and 2018. I think we began to have some positive results from the campaign of, uh, of maximum pressure, but I think we've had some setbacks since that time. Well, what more do you think Japan and the United States can do to, to prevent North Korea from being a danger to the whole world, right? Including its nuclear and missile programs, and of course, uh, an important point always for Japan is this, is the is the abductions issue, right? The you know the, this this horrible crime of uh, of, of North Koreans kidnapping uh, yeah. young Japanese people off off the shores, and 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 many of the, the fates uh, of these uh, of these victims are still unresolved. So, could you share with our viewers your assessment of the danger from North Korea and what more we can do about it? Uh, with regard to Japan's policy uh, toward uh, North Korea, uh, we have the basic document released uh, by Prime Minister Koizumi and Chairman uh, Kim Jong-il uh, called Japan DPRK Pyongyang Declaration. And Japan's basic policy orientation is to comprehensively resolve the outstanding issues of concern, including, including the abductions, missile, and nuclear issues, and settle the unfortunate past and aiming uh, for the normalization of the diplomatic relations uh, between the two sides. And this policy uh, remains the same under the current Suga administration. Uh, you touched on the abductions uh, issue. As you rightly mentioned, 
North Korea kidnapped a large number of Japanese citizens, including then 13-year-old girl, and they were still uh, in North Korea, uh, not being able to come back to Japan. So this is uh, uh, such an intolerable act, and uh, we will never uh, condone uh, what they have done uh, to the Japanese citizens. But on uh, the, this specific issue, President Trump uh, conveyed uh, my view as well as Japan's position directly to Chairman Kim Jong-un. And I do appreciate uh, what President Trump uh, had done uh, on this front. And we will continue uh, our sincere efforts to resolve this abductions issue through the cl close collaboration between Japan and the United States, as well as in close coordination collaboration with the entire international community. And on the nuclear and missile issues, uh, we have to ensure close cooperation uh, bilaterally and also trilaterally with the Republic of Korea uh, to ensure full implementation of the relevant UN Security Council resolutions aiming uh, for North Korea's CBID, complete, verifiable, and irreversible dismantlement of all weapons of mass destruction. And to do so, we have to have a united front in the international community, and we have to maintain the maximum pressure against North Korea moving forward. And there is no doubt that the sanctions are working effectively on North Korea. Uh, in the area of ship-to-ship -ship transfers, Japan took the lead uh, to materialize global uh, collaboration to address this issue, uh, including uh, our collaboration uh, with the United States. And uh, the key uh, is to uh, maintain the united front of the international community. And by doing that, uh, we uh, will be able uh, to exercise maximum pressure on North Korea so as to encourage North Korea's major policy change in the future. You know, I, I agree with you. I, I know we've made some progress at times on, on the maximum pressure to test this thesis that we could convince Kim Jong-un he's safer without the weapons than he is with them. But there is so much more to be done. And I hope that I hope we stick with that policy. And I'm glad I, that it seems like the relationship between Japan and South Korea is getting stronger. I think that helps as well. So there have been some positive developments I, uh, that I hope the Biden administration can 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 pers can continue. I hope that they don't go back to the failed pattern of previous efforts. However, uh, I'd like to ask you one last geopolitical question, and it's kind of an unfair one because it's very general. But you visited the Middle East many times as Prime Minister. I, I would say you're a, an expert about the problems of the Middle East, those involving. Iran and its its continued uh, proxy wars in, in the region, how that's feeding this devastating cycle of sectarian violence. Uh, I would just like to ask you generally, how do you see the current situation in the Middle East? Uh, what is your prediction about the trajectory of the Middle East? And what can Japan, the U.S. and others do uh, to, to try to at least keep the situation across the region from getting worse? Oh, oh. Of course, uh, Japan is far from the Middle East uh, geographically, but the fact is that uh, we depend on the Middle East uh, for almost 90% of the crude oil import. And that is why uh, stability and peace on the ground in the Middle East has critical implication of Japan's own national interest. Maybe it may be fair to say that uh, psychologically, all Japanese understand that the Middle East region is important, but the awareness is, was not just there. But because of my firm belief and conviction that this region is critically important for Japan, I decided to travel to the region many times as the Prime Minister. And speaking of Japan's involvement and engagement with the Middle East region, we do have a unique position and standing. For example, between Japan and Israel, we do have a historically deep ties. And I've been to Israel two times, Prime Minister Netanyahu came to Japan two times. But also on top of that, we do have 
deep relations with Palestine and other Arab nations. And on top of that, we do have a traditional ties uh, with Iran. So we do have this leverage of uh, traditional ties uh, with Iran. And after a series of uh, thorough consultation with President Trump, I decided to visit Iran in the month of June of 2019, where I uh, had meetings uh, with Supreme Leader Khamenei as well as uh, President Rouhani. Uh, during these meetings, I conveyed uh, President Trump's messages and views to the Iranian leadership. And afterwards, I also conveyed Iranian views uh, to uh, President Trump after I returned to Japan. And also with regard to the Middle East peace process, uh, for example, uh, Japan has been promoting uh, this unique initiative of Corridor for Peace and Prosperity in the region. Uh, this is the initiative aimed at ensuring economic independence of Palestine through the uh, full party collaboration among Japan, Palestine, Israel, and uh, Jordan. Uh, more specifically, uh, this is an initiative uh, to realize the social economic development of Palestine, uh, especially in the uh, Jordan Valley uh, area, uh, through creating jobs and uh, and also ensuring uh, the consumption and economic activities uh, on the ground. So key will be uh, the mutual confidence among the four parties uh, of uh, Japan, Palestine, Israel, and Jordan. And we have to uh, maintain perseverance and consistency uh, to seek uh, such uh, joint endeavor. Uh, most recently, uh, there were political developments both in Iran and Israel, and uh, hardliners won uh, respective uh, elections uh, there. And because of this, uh, some uh, are having this quite pessimistic views about the outlook and prospect of the regional developments. But having said that, it is also true that new leaders uh, can aspire for a change and they might be able to bring something new uh, to the table. And it has been the case that if there is a hardliner uh, leader of a nation, uh, he or she may start pursuing uh, any of the uh, historic achievement, both in the political sense or even the diplomatic uh, sense. So I do have uh, some hope uh, for such a uh, turnover and they might be able to bring uh, something concrete uh, moving forward. So if the international community uh, observes uh, such willingness coming out of these newly elected leaders of Iran and Israel, we have to uh, lend our support and encourage further positive developments on the ground. Abhishan, I think you're more. I think you're more optimistic than, than I am on this. In fact, I would say as I would say that while there is a new leader in Israel, the leader in Iran is the same, <laughs> and I think that's where the problem is. But, but I think you're absolutely right. Engagement is the only alternative, right? I mean, what else can you do? Because I, I think in the Middle East, just when you think it can't get worse, it actually can get worse, and of course, as you know, problems that originate in the Middle East don't stay there, right? So I, I think I, I admire your tenacity and your diplomacy, and and I think there is no other alternative. You know, you've been so generous with your time. I do have one important final question, though. You know, I wish that you had been able to transition out of the prime ministership in a better year. It was a bad year for everybody across the world, right, with a, with a pandemic and a recession associated with the pandemic. But I think the strength of your leadership is, is, is and and uh, and Prime Minister Suga's leadership is going to carry Japan through certainly, and your and Japan will emerge stronger uh, is from this horrible year. And I wanted to ask you about some of the signs of that strength, the strength of, of Japan. Right before the pandemic broke out, I was in Japan. Uh, you, you might I think you know I'm a I'm a fan of rugby. I used to play rugby, and I was there for Rugby World Cup, and I saw this amazing. Japanese team uh, advanced to the quarterfinals for the first time in history. It was the best ball handling and running rugby I've I've ever seen. And then, of course, 
lots of good news, you know, since then from in the area in the, in the uh, realm of sport, despite the pandemic. Your friend and someone with whom I know you've golfed frequently, uh, Hideki uh, Matsuyama, won the Masters and became the first ever Japanese professional golfer to win a men's major golf championship. And I'm with family now in Southern California, where everybody is talking about another Japanese phenomenal athlete. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, Shohei Otani, the, the great pitcher for the Anaheim Angels, who, in, in, in like Babe Ruth, you know, is a, is, a, is a great pitcher who hits home runs all the time. He hit six home runs in six games in a row, uh, for, for example. So now the Summer Olympics are coming up. They're going to begin in Tokyo on July 23rd. And I'd just like to ask you, what can you tell our viewers about your predictions for the Olympics, how you think it's going to go, and then anything you'd like to share about Japanese sports uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, what, what, the, what Americans should know about Japanese athletes? The first time that I played golf with President Trump was with Mr. Ernie Els. And I still vividly remember uh, that uh, he said to me that if there is ever a Japanese golf player who would win the Masters, that would be definitely Hideki Matsuyama. And I still remember uh, his uh, uh, prediction. And afterwards, I also had the pleasure of playing golf together uh, with uh, President Trump and Hideki Matsuyama at uh, Kasumi Gaseki uh, Country uh, Club. Uh, that will be the venue for the Olympic uh, golf event. And both uh, Mr. Matsuyama and President Trump uh, vividly uh, and fondly remember the time that I spent uh, with these two playing golf. And right after the historic victory of uh, Mr. Matsuyama, uh, President Trump and also Mr. Matsuyama uh, got in touch with me uh, to celebrate the time that uh, we spent uh, together. And I sincerely hope that uh, Mr. Matsuyama uh, will have a great success uh, at the upcoming uh, Tokyo Olympics, uh, uh, earning the gold medal, I hope. Well, it is true that uh, we are still uh, in the era of the COVID-19. But uh, moving forward, we will continue to work with the entire international community and we are absolutely determined uh, to realize a very successful Tokyo Games uh, this year in Tokyo. And by doing that, we hope uh, to bring inspiration uh, to all people on the globe. And one potential highlight of the Olympics uh, will be uh, 100 by four uh, times male relay. And I do hope that the Americans and the Japanese uh, teams uh, will compete with each other uh, uh, for that event uh, uh, to seek the gold medal. Great. Well, I'm sure it will be a successful Olympics and the world's ready for it. And I'm glad that Japan will provide us with that, with that boost. Prime Minister Abe, I, I can't thank you enough on, on behalf of the Hoover Institution, the Hudson Institute, Thank you for helping us learn more uh, about battlegrounds important to building a future of peace and prosperity for generations to come. And thank you especially for your leadership and vision over the years. It was wonderful to be with you. Thank you very much. I hope I, I will see you again. Thank you. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.